Good afternoon, and welcome to EHS Today webcast, How Is Your Machinery Health? Sponsored by Pills Automation Safety. My name is Adrienne Selko, and I'm Senior Editor of EHS Today. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. If at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit the F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view the webinar. If you are having any technical difficulties during today's session, press the question mark help button on the upper right corner to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the maximize icon in the upper right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. To submit your questions, simply type them into the Ask a Question window on the left side of your screen and hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any time. Also be aware today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today website within the next day for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. When the webinar ends, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen. I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have with us Blair Randall, who is Territory Channel Manager in the Western States region at Pills. He has been with the company for nine years, and his extensive professional experience includes sales and marketing management positions, sales engineering positions, with both industrial automation and motion control companies. And with that, let's get started, Blair. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. I appreciate it. So we are going to talk about the uh, machinery life cycle today and the uh, effects of safety within that life cycle. So initially, uh, this particular pinwheel, if you will, is, is our representation of the machinery uh, life cycle. And whether you're creating a new piece of equipment or you're upgrading an existing piece of equipment, these particular uh, safety concepts would need to be used in the process of making that equipment up to speed and in a safe mode, if you will, for the for operators and also for the machinery. So there, there's five different uh, categories associated with, uh, with the uh, safety of industrial automation equipment. Uh, the risk assessment is, is the starting point. Everything starts with a risk assessment. So you, you would have a risk assessment. Within the risk assessment, we would create or you would create a safety concept uh, of machinery upgrades or changes. Uh, the safety design would then need to be implemented, which is uh, the result of the concept, safety concept and the uh, particular uh, standards that are being used in the risk assessment. Then it needs to be built, and that's where the safety uh, implementation comes into play, and, uh, and safety validation, which is the end of these uh, five different uh, categories of safety in this uh, life cycle. And so um, the uh, risk assessment in particular uh, is, is probably the more, more detailed um, thing that needs to be done because uh, without a proper risk assessment, everything else follows beyond that as a result of that risk assessment. So the risk assessment uh, is used to identify the applicable standards and regulations, then there are a lot of them, um, defining the machine limits, uh, identify risk in each of the machine's uh, life cycle phases, and estimate and assess the risk, and also recommend an approach for reducing risk, which is what we call uh, a safety concept. So that's, those are the key elements of, of the risk assessment. And, and keep in mind that uh, while this is uh, information that you can do yourself as a, as a plant manager or have somebody on staff doing this type of work uh, because they are certified in safety or, or they are, have enough logical experience in safety design, uh, we also do that as, as a company at PILS. So PILS is, is a certified uh, third-party uh, safety solutions provider. So we do risk assessments all the time, among other things, just, just to keep that in mind. Okay, so uh, as, as far as the risk assessment 
um, hierarchy, the, the key element in, in the risk assessment procedure is uh, an ISO standard that we call, or that's called ISO 12100 up here in this, in this pyramid. <clears throat> so that is the start of the procedure needed to do a risk assessment. Within that procedure, all these other standards come into play depending on what's applicable and what is not applicable. So you might run into certain situations in a, uh, in a machine design that a specific uh, regulation would need to be used to uh, resolve that issue within that particular hazard. But you always start with a 12100 uh, safety of machinery as far as that process goes. Okay, so, um, and there are three or four, I think there's four different kinds of risk assessments that, that are, are uh, what we talk about, and they include uh, machinery safety audit, which basically is a pre-risk assessment. What, what that does is that if you're a, a large user with a lot, lot of uh, automated equipment in the plant and you have a new edict, you have a new policy say, saying, I need to achieve a certain performance level of safety for all of them, as a minimum, and so you don't know how to approach that or how to do that or even how to budget for that. And so what the machinery safety audit does, it allows uh, pills or somebody else to look at what we call a 10,000 foot view of the different machines in the plant and prioritize them based on the most significant issue that you have to the least significant issue that you have. So that when you do get budgeting uh, for doing uh, upgrades of, of that equipment, you'll work on, on the worst situation to, to the least situation in terms of safety levels. So you have something that's very dangerous, you want to take care of that first. Something that's the least dangerous or has, has very little safety issues with it would be the last thing you do want to do. So that's the purpose of the machinery safety audit. <clears throat> it gives you a prioritized view of the equipment that you have several machines and you get a listing of what is the first thing that should be done, the second, the third, the fourth, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's what we call a machinery safety audit. Second, a design risk assessment is uh, an OEM in particular is creating a piece of equipment, or it might be a user with in-house capabilities of designing their own equipment. They want to be able to build the safety in the equipment before it's built. And in order to do that, somebody has to review that equipment designed for an appropriate level of safety for each of the hazard points and the risk points within that, that equipment. And so with schematics and uh, uh, layout drawings and uh, operational sequences and that sort of thing, a lot of that safety can be put into the equipment before you get into actually fabricating manufacturing equipment. So that's what we call uh, a design risk assessment. Then there's an OEM risk assessment, which is an OEM has built a machine, uh, it's on his floor ready to ship to somebody, but they just want to confirm that the, the uh, particular safety that they've built into the equipment is appropriate for the, for the design of the equipment. And so uh, pills or somebody else would need to come in and do a risk assessment at the OEM site to make sure the equipment is, is properly uh, designed for, for safe operation before it ships to their customer. And so that's called an OEM uh, risk assessment. And then last but not least, and we get this more often than not, is the end user installed a risk assessment. And that's where two things, uh, a piece of OEM equipment has shipped, um, either the, their customer or they want to uh, do a risk assessment before it actually gets put into production. And so that happens after the machine is shipped to, to the end user, and we will go through the same process at an end user and full risk assessment. And we, we run into this type of risk assessment uh, more often than not, because typically if an OSHA uh, fine happens at, at a plant or somebody gets hurt at a plant or somebody wants to upgrade their safety because they have new policies within the plant, we would, or somebody would <laughs> go into that plant and do an installed machinery risk assessment to see what the issues are and how to upgrade the safety in that equipment. So those, those are the four kind of uh, definitions and uh, terminology that is used on the risk assessments that are associated with the machinery uh, life cycle. 
As I mentioned, the ISO 1200, uh, 12100 standard is, is the risk assessment standard that everybody that does risk assessments would need to follow. And basically, there, there, there's two things, or, or three things possibly, that you want to uh, have as a result of using this, this standard. First of all, you have to identify all of the hazards within the equipment, all of the risk associated with those standards, or with those uh, hazards, and determine what level of safety would be appropriate for that particular hazard and that particular risk. Uh, once that is done, then you would also create uh, a safety concept, a, a way to resolve these issues with the hazard and the risk associated with that hazard. And that can be done in two ways. One, you actually redesign the equipment at that particular hazard point to eliminate or reduce the, the risk. Or you add what's known as engineering uh, control to that particular risk or hazard to make sure that when this does, or if this does fail, it fails in a safe mode. It doesn't hurt anybody. And so that's, that's the purpose of the, of the ISO 12100 standard as, as the standard used for risk assessment, determining the different hazards, the different risks, the levels of risk, and the solutions. Within the um, Risk assessment itself, more often than not, you're going to need a control system in, in, this, in this design. And again, that, that assumes that not everything can be done by changing the design of the machine to re reduce or minimize or eliminate risk. And so you need control solutions. And these, that's the safety-related parts of a control system that will do that. <clears throat> And there are two standards associated with that, the ISO 13849-1 standard on the left and the IEC 62061 standard on the right. Um, both of these are used in Europe for CE marking. Uh, more often than not, you'll see the ISO 13849-1 standard used in the US, unless possibly somebody needs a, a piece of equipment CE marked. And so the, either one of these can be used for, for, that, for that category, for, for that solution. And basically all this does is it's given you a means of determining the level of risk and the level of safety performance that is required based on that risk level. For instance, this is the ISO standard 13849-1. This is uh, the uh, risk graph, if you will. And basically I'm going from left to right. Uh, each risk, each hazard has to be qualified in some way uh, what is the severity of the risk? What is the frequency of exposure to the risk? What is the probability of avoiding the risk? Pretty much those three questions have to be answered. So if it, the risk is small, it's, it's low frequency exposure, and it, you can probably avoid it, then you probably only need a, what we call performance level A of safety. The other extreme, you have a severe risk, you have high frequency of exposure to that risk, the probability is low of, of avoiding it, and so you better have safety in there that we would call a performance level E. So that's how you determine what level of safety that is needed for a specific combination of hazard and risk. The IEC, excuse me, the IEC standard 62061 is similar in its questionnaire, or questions I should say, and then it has a result of not performance level A, B, C, D, and E, but, but still levels of safety, as you see down here. And so it's asking the basically the same questions, the probability of occurrence, the avoidance possibility, and the severity of, 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 the, of the risk. And so those are needed to determine the levels of safety during this risk assessment. <clears throat> There are a lot of standards associated with uh, industrial automation safety. Uh, I'm listing a few here. I'm not going to go into any of these in, in any particular detail, but during the uh, risk assessment process, when, when something is seen as a hazard and a risk is associated with that hazard, there has to be a particular uh, standard associated with how to solve this particular issue and reduce the hazard to an acceptable level uh, of safety, uh, a higher level of safety by reducing the risk. And so here's a number of IEC standards in this list here and a number of ISO standards listed here. And there are several others. But like I said, the safety 
risk assessment will determine what are, are appropriate standards to use to solve the issues of safety within this particular uh, piece of equipment. This is an example that we'll use throughout the rest of the presentation here just to, to, to help uh, clarify some things. This is a, let's call this a design risk assessment. This is a, a, a um, rendering of a uh, two-zone um, robot-controlled palletizer. And so you, just to give you a, how this all works, we have a, a forklift coming in here with empty pallets. It's being indexed over to this part of, of the process. The robot will do a pick and place of material, material that's randomly placed on conveyors and then organize it into a nice palletized solution and then exit uh, full pelletized uh, boxes, if you will, coming out of the system. So this is a continuous process. But there's a few things that have to be looked at here. And uh, the people that design this machine, for instance, are putting some stuff in here that they think is, is safety related. And somebody has to come in there and do a risk assessment to see if it's an appropriate way to solve some of these problems. So for instance, we have a light curtain over here. <clears throat> To, to determine whether we should stop in the machine when the forklift comes in or somebody walks in here. <clears throat> we have a light curtain over here that is sensing the exiting of this palletized, fully loaded palletized uh, box, if you will. And so when it exits, we don't want the machine to stop. So we have what we call a muting lamp over here to ignore this box when it exits and the machine continues to run. But if somebody were to come in on the other side, we would want to stop the machine. And then third, we have uh, person over here that's going to pick up any boxes that fall on the floor and put them back on the conveyor to make things continue to work. But if he opens the door and the robot is not over on this side of the machine, um, zone one will continue to run, zone two will, will, will possibly stop. And in this case, the logic allows this, everything to, to move because the risk assessment said it was safe enough for everything to move properly. So he comes in here, picks up the box and puts it back on, comes out and closes the door. So that's some of the uh, uh, safety, if you will, uh, of the machine. And then over here on the control panel, we have an e-stop. The e-stop stops zone one immediately. It stops the zone two with a time delay. And it has safety relays They're built into it to monitor the various uh, safety functions within the machine. So, so that's the logic of this two-zone controller. So let's see how that ties into a risk assessment. First of all, the risk assessment uh, person, again, would be using the ISO 12100 standard to determine where all of the uh, risk is, where all the hazards are, and what to do about um, referencing specific standards associated with given hazards and then determine a safety concept out of that. So if we keep on going around this machine, we'll see over here we have the light curtain as was mentioned. Well, there's an ISO standard that talks about the, the safe distance that the light curtain has to be away from the hazard itself. And so that has to be developed and performed and tested when you mount a light curtain in an area. Uh, if somebody's walking in here, there's uh, obviously uh, speed of all involved when somebody walks into the zone. So you have to make sure that everything stops here in time when this light curtain is breached. And so that light curtain has to be put at a particular distance to make sure that happens. So that's part of this, of this ISO standard over here. <clears throat> we have a pec, looks like plexiglass uh, around the edges of the, the thing. The, this particular bordering is in areas where you don't have to access any area, but you want to make sure that nobody can walk into the machine while it's running and have issues with upper and lower uh, limbs. And so that this ISO standard would be referenced here to make sure this material here is at a particular height and then at a particular distance away from any particular um, hazard that might be in that area. And so there's standards to reference to make sure that this is done properly over here for these uh, borders. And you'll see a lot of fencing in applications, especially in robot applications that are not um, collaborative. <clears throat> and we have another uh, access point here. This is similar in, in a time delay, possibly, where you have a interlock on a, a guard locking application or not guard locking. It depends on what happens when the door opens. If there's something that's moving close to that door, you better make sure that stops when the door is open in time for somebody to walk in and not get hurt. And so 
um, this standard would apply here as well as, as the light trigger standard does here. Or maybe it doesn't need to be locked. It all depends on how far away the actuator is uh, that uh, when the door opens, it'll stop in time before somebody actually gets into the zone. So in this particular hazard area and risk, this particular standard would be used. Uh, ESOP standards, um, there, there are certain particular uh, ESOP standards that would be used. Every, every machine pretty much uses an ESOP. Well, there's particular uh, standards associated with those ESOPs that need to be complied with. So this particular ESOP is actually controlling both zones. Uh, when we push the ESOP, zone one stops immediately, zone two stops with a slight time delay. But in order to use an ESOP, you have to follow the standard to make sure you've got the right ESOP and it's following that particular standard. And then last but not least, the, um, the ISO standards we just mentioned for uh, the safety uh, related electrical, electronic and programmable electronic control systems. <clears throat> And that's these two standards here, <clears throat> the 13849 and the uh, 62061. And so that <clears throat> gives you <coughs> information on the uh, uh, requirements for a safety-related control system, typically known as a safety relay. <clears throat> and so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on. So here's the risk assessment. I, I went around and found all the hazards. I referenced all the uh, standards associated with that hazard. Now I have to find solutions to make sure that the hazard are reduced to a level that's, uh, that's acceptable in terms of safety. <clears throat> so the safety concept is the next step in this process, which is down here in this in pinwheel, if you will. <clears throat> and so that is used to create uh, concepts of how you would reduce the, the risk and, and get to a safety level that's acceptable. And here's all, all the bullet points <coughs> that allow you to do that. So, <coughs> for instance, here's a couple of graphics on the left is a uh, conveyor system that has a cover on it. So if the cover is open, nothing works or nothing moves. <clears throat> and if the cover closed, everything is, is operational. <clears throat> on the right side, we have what looks like a stretch wrap <clears throat> palletizer that brings in equipment here. There's no safety on it here. And then the safety concept adds uh, light curtains <clears throat> with um, with muting and a, a, a safety door with safety sensors on the door itself and the control system with e-stops. There's an e-stop here and an e-stop there. So that, that's a safety concept that would be presented as a solution. <clears throat> so here are some of the uh, uh, categories associated with uh, safety concepts. Uh, we want to make sure we have protection from electrical energy and electrical energy that's driving actuators. Uh, pneumatic energy and pneumatic energy that's driving actuators. And of course, hydraulic en energy and, and the energy associated with hydraulic actuation. So <clears throat> we wanna make sure that is taken care of. Uh, mechanical risk reduction, here's a couple of, of pictures here. Here's a, here's a uh, chain guard covering this chain and sprocket. <clears throat> and then we have fencing up here. Here we have a lockout tagout mechanism <clears throat> so that if you have risk because the electricity is available when you're inside a machine, <clears throat> you want to make sure that that is removed. And that's what a lockout tagout will do. <clears throat> and then we have the uh, safety related control engineering risk reduction over here, which is actually monitoring all of these safety functions to make sure they're working properly and to control the outputs based on their states. And of course, robot safety. We have a lot of uh, publicity, a lot of applications now with robots coming into the mix, both collaborative robots and isolated robots. And so there's a lot of safety related uh, standards associated with robot use. <clears throat> 
So next we have the safety design after the concept. And the safety design actually is the engineering associated with the actual solution for the control system and the associated safety uh, devices within the equipment. So we'll look at that. <clears throat> there are basically uh, three different <clears throat> safety uh, control system block diagrams that would be used, and they would depend on the level of safety needed. For instance, uh, this is what we call our single channel uh, inputs, logic outputs, single channel, no feedback. This is single channel with some feedback of diagnostic information that you want to evaluate, make sure the inputs and outputs are, are working properly. And this is the uh, typical, we find a lot of this. These are called redundant circuits. And so you have two inputs, two logic uh, circuits that are run, running redundantly, and two redundant outputs. And so based on the level of safety needed, we'll determine what, what type of circuit is needed in, in the control system that's used for safety. For instance, um, single channel would be performance level A and B probably. Uh, single channel with some feedback could be performance level C. There's a, other factors associated with that. And then redundant logic would be for performance level D and E. So there's a lot of risk and you have a lot more need for diagnostic coverage, a lot more need for making sure that when things do happen that everything shuts down in a safe state. <clears throat> the uh, Pascal software tool that PILS offers in particular allows you to confirm that the performance level you think you can get from the design in the safety design actually is going to be available to you. So this software tool is, it has a library of a tremendous amount of components in it. Some of those components are safety rated components. Some of those are general purpose components, but if they are general purpose, they need specific uh, specifications needed about those components to be loaded into the parameters of this software package to see if they actually can be used in safety. In the case of, of PILS, all of our products are loaded into the software. This is a PILS product. And all of our products are already uh, pre-defined uh, as being available for a particular level of performance level. So they are considered safety rated components, where others may or may not be that way. And so this is used to determine uh, that the level of safety that you want actually is the level of safety that you're getting. Uh, for instance, here's a performance level C. I've got this circuit in here. I've got some uh, single channel, and I, I've got particular components that are, are being brought up from the Pascal library. And it's calculating and it's saying, yeah, I, you're, you want the PLC and you're getting PLC. So that tells you that in, in, indeed you're getting the performance level that you want. And then there's other examples for, for D&E and the, both of these would have redundancy on, on, on this particular block that I am so up here. So this is a tool used to confirm that the design is correct for the performance level that's needed. <clears throat> Some other examples here, uh, again, you have the uh, safety concept, you have the safety design based on that concept, and you have the block diagram associated with that design. For instance, this design here is apparently a, a dual channel, uh, dual inputs, redundancy on the logic and redundancy on the outputs. And so, uh, that's part of the Pascal tool to make sure you're that you're performing at the level of safety that you need before you actually buy the components and, and wire it into the solution. <clears throat> Some other examples here. Uh, here's a two-channel uh, redundant input and redundant output here. So we, uh, we're, we're using this block diagram. We have an ESOP with, with two channels coming in from the ESOP. We have two outputs controlling uh, this motor through a redundant outputs, and we have some feedback from that motor with its auxiliary contacts coming back into the safety controller. So this is a redundant solution using this block diagram. This is a single channel solution over here uh, using this block diagram. And so once you get to this, you need to make sure that you're, you're using a particular um, appropriate control block diagram uh, using that Pascal tool. <clears throat> and safety implementation. The, uh, we're, 
we're almost done with this, it's right over here. And so now you have to design it, you have to test it, you have to run it before you actually put it into production. And so this takes the safety design and takes it into an actual production of that particular safety design. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll go back to this two zone controller again. And you can see here we have a we have a new product that fills called MyPNAS, which is a hardware configurable safety relay, which is specific for a specific application. This particular relay comes shipped already assembled and tested based on the information that was provided to us by the customer. <clears throat> and so back on this two zone controller here. Uh, we have a, a tool here called MyPNOS Creator, uh, and that MyPNOS uh, package is used to look at the logic that you need for, for the safety in this circuit. And once you're comfortable with that, then you can order the hardware, and the hardware will be tested and shipped to you with some very nice uh, documentation. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, we have uh, two zones being controlled here. I mentioned earlier the e-stop. If I push these stop, zone one stops immediately. Zone two stops with a slight time delay. And you'll see that up here. This is the E stop controlling zone one, and that same E stop is controlling zone two. So if I push the E stop, the output moving anything in zone one will stop. The output pushing anything, controlling anything, or moving anything in zone two will stop after a slight time delay. And so that's part of the process. And then down here we have some more logic which says that if the operator opens the door and this light curtain internally is breached because the robot is in this zone, then the machine will stop in zone one. Otherwise, if the door is open but the light curtain is still active, uh, everything will continue to move and he can go in there and get the box back on the conveyor. That's what that's all about. And of course, the other option is if, if he opens the door and this particular new uh, empty uh, pallet is moving in this direction and it's breaking the beam, then it'll stop. So, I mean, that's just some of the logic you can you can add and check and verify before actually buying product for, for the uh, solution for this implementation of, of the safety. And then we have uh, this ESOP, uh, or excuse me, this light curtain over here, uh, which uh, is in zone two. So that's this light curtain right here. If, if I break this with a with a with somebody walking in or a, a um, forklift bringing in a new group of pallets, uh, this zone two will stop after a time delay. And I'm not sure exactly what that time delay is for, other than maybe clearing out everything here uh, if possible, but the risk assessment said that it's okay to do that without anybody being at risk. And so that's some of the logic associated with that light curtain. <clears throat> and then last, this light curtain over here, if I'm exiting the light curtain, uh, uh, yeah, if I'm exiting the, uh, system with a fully loaded pallet, uh, the light curtain beam is broken from that, but nothing will stop because uh, there's some sensors down here that's sensing that a pallet is being exiting. So we're gonna mute the system, allowing the light curtain to be broken without stopping the system. And there'll be a muting lamp that turns on as that result. But if somebody were to come in from the other side and break this beam, then zone one would stop immediately. And so that's, that's some of the logic associated with this particular two zone controller uh, control with this particular MyPNA as being the solution for the implementation of that safety. <clears throat> and uh, if you uh, go this route, you also get a fairly nice complement of documentation with MyPNAS. Um, again, this MyPNAS creator, <clears throat> my, the MyPNAS package, gives you the ability to emulate the logic in the, in, the, in the control system that you think you need to make sure you're getting what you want. So if I, if I push this in, in the uh, creator, uh, I should stop this immediately. So if I push this, this goes to a different color and this should stop and go to a different color immediately. And you can test all of that logic accordingly. And then of course, when I push that east up over here, not only will this stop immediately, but this will turn off after two seconds. And so you're actually able to uh, confirm that the logic that you want is the logic that you expect and the logic that will work for you before you order anything. And so when you do order the MyPNAS system, you get a very uh, long part number consisting of these customized hardware components uh, that will be a good solution 
for your application, and then you also get a, a listing of individual part numbers, and you get a complete wiring diagram of those part numbers. So it's it's a fairly convenient way to go, and it's kind of a newer level of safety uh, relays uh, available on the marketplace <clears throat> or in the marketplace. Last but not least, we're up here. <clears throat> So we have this machinery done, uh, either a new piece of machinery, it's been shipped, it's been designed with the safety that's been needed or required. We got <clears throat> power to the equipment, but we don't want to put it in production quite yet. We want to make sure everything is done the way we thought it should be done. And that's what safety validation does. So uh, once it's ready to go, uh, somebody will have to validate that the actual design and the implementation of that design matches the safety level of, of performance needed. And this, this is required because maybe once the machine is shipped to the location, something else may have, have come up based on the area around that machine that you would not be aware of until you actually saw it yourself. And so you want to make sure that before you actually put this in production, that you're validating that all the components, all the safety levels, <clears throat> and all the wiring was done correctly, and then you're ready to put it in production. So that's what safety validation does for you. <clears throat> a couple of uh, other things I want to talk about before we end this. Uh, we have a very nice uh, safety compendium that PILS offers, which is a 328-page uh, uh, catalog, if you will, or document of, of safety uh, definitions, uh, safety processes, and uh, this is all free from downloading it from our website. So if you're interested in gaining more knowledge about safety and industrial automation equipment, by all means, uh, download this for your, for your library. It, it gives you a lot of good information, and it builds your knowledge for how to make sure uh, equipment that is operating in the plant is and remains safe. And then also, if you are able to um, have uh, on staff um, experts, if you will, or people responsible for risk assessments, you may want to use your own resources rather than getting a third party in there. Those people need to be qualified to do that. And so we also offer what's known as a certified machinery safety expert course, which is a four day course with, with a uh, test at the end. And if you pass the test after taking the course, you become a four-year CMSE. And so it gives you credentials to look at equipment, do risk assessments on equipment, and, and create uh, solutions that will enhance the safety of both the equipment and the people that operate on the equipment. So these are two uh, particular uh, resources that, uh, that are available to you as, as a potential uh, expert in, in this in this field. And um, with that, I will turn this back to Adrian. Great. Thank you very much. I want to uh, remind our audience to please fill out the form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. And we will jump into questions. The first question, does OSHA allow you to rely upon interlock to prevent machine motion during lockout tagout scenarios? Uh, no, a lockout tagout is used for removing all power to anything that's actuation related in the equipment itself. Now, there might be a situation where you may want to have pilot power within the machine, and you, you may have that as a, as a possibility during lockout tagout, but you have to make sure that that pilot power is not turning on any actuators and, and moving anything around in the, in the machine. It has to be kind of a low current, low voltage uh, answer, but it, it's not allowing you to move anything in the machine. All right, thank you. The next question, does OSHA have any standards for controls, for example, start button design and location, ESOS design and location, and jogging switches? Yeah, they, they do, but I think it's under the ANSI standards. Um, the, the standards I've referenced here are international standards that we normally use. So, and a lot of those are also acceptable by, by OSHA and are duplicated really by ANSI in a lot of cases. So it, it depends on the situation, but there's a lot of 
different standards around the world that would be acceptable by OSHA. Okay, this question, doesn't the U.S. usually adopt UL certification and follow ANSI B11.0 for RA? They do. I mean, that, that can be done as well. Uh, it, again, part of, part of the uh, fact that PILS is a European country, excuse me, company, uh, references international standards. And so I, what I've referenced here are the IEC standards and the um, and the ISO standards, but uh, there are other standards that could, that could be used as well, yes. Okay, this question is, what's the difference between a machinery safety audit and a risk assessment, and do I need to do both? Yeah, great question. Well, like I said in the presentation, the machinery safety audit is not a risk assessment, it's a pre-risk assessment, and it, it looks at a multiple amount of machines in, in a, let's say, a large plant that has a lot of automation, and it prioritizes the machines based on what is the worst safety issues to the least issues with safety so that um, you know people can define how they would budget upgrading that equipment and they would budget it based on, on, on the worst to, 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 to the least uh, safety levels. Okay, and this is concerning the presentation. How often should my equipment go through this cycle? Well, um, the, the equipment, once it's designed and in, in production going through the cycle, it's as safe as it, as it probably can be, uh, but things do change. Um, if, if anything changes on the equipment or you want to enhance the equipment to do other things besides what it was originally designed to do, then you need to do that all over again with a with, uh, with risk assessment with, with the newer designs in there. So uh, once the machine is designed, the, the other issue is how long should it be running in the, in the in the production of whatever is being produced? But that's that's a function of how the life of the actual components within the equipment, or that becomes a maintenance issue more than anything else. But the actual design itself, once it's designed safe and it doesn't get a design change on it, should last as long as the components are capable of running. Okay, the next question, how does PASCO accommodate PL design verifications and compliance for non-PIL safety functions? Say that one more time. Sure. How does PASCO accommodate PL design verifications slash compliance for non-PIL safety functions? Oh, okay, very good. Um, the uh, for instance, Alan Bradley or a number of different um, components being used in um, safety circuits, if, if they're safety rated, that means they've gone through a uh, safety lab for testing for performance level of safety. And so if they're in that library of Pascal, that information will be put into that library with that, with that particular component. And that might include other particular uh, characteristics like di uh, diagnostic coverage, mean times of dangerous failure. Um, there's a few others as well that, that don't come to mind, but those would, would also be either uh, added into the Pascal library for a specific component if you're not sure if it's safe rated or not. Um, and then once that information is in there, that particular uh, number would be used to calculate whether that particular component can be used in, in a safety circuit. Okay, when performing an OEM risk assessment, should a formal report be sent to the OEM to fix? Should a formal report be sent to the OEM? To fix, correct. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, typically, it, obviously, if it's a third party like Bill going in there and doing a OEM risk assessment, they want to know what they need to do to fix their equipment to make sure it meets performance levels required. And so either, either nothing needs to happen because they've done it right to begin with, or they need to modify the equipment before it ships to their customer but based on the risk assessment that was given to them. Okay, I think we've gone through all the questions, so let me check. Um, this one more. Is this the same as a pre-start health and safety? 
I'm, you're a little garbled. Say it, say it one more time. Is this the same as a pre-start health and safety? But I'm guessing you're talking about the earlier risk assessments. Wasn't that? It's not that specific. We'll skip that one. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Okay, here's one more. Uh, can I create a safety relay system, uh, my PNAS, for just one machine in my plant, or is this more for just OEM making multiple machines with a safety relay system? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> Either way, um, basically, the my PNAS is a kind of an upgraded solution uh, for. Uh, traditional individual safety relays that have to be selected, determine whether they work together, and wired and tested uh, as individual items in, in the final equipment. So whether that's one piece of equipment or several, it's the same issue. So you can do a MIP not solution with one machine or obviously several machines that are, you know, OEM machines that you just repeat that particular component uh, of multiple safety relays uh, from one machine to the next to the machines are OEM, they're, they're actually cloned. So e either way, there's a lot of benefit for using the MyPNAS if you're traditionally using individual safety relays in particular. Okay, great. I think we've covered the questions. I want to thank our speaker, Blair Randall, for an excellent presentation today. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Pills. And on behalf of VHS Today, have a productive remainder of the day.